Basil looked at Dorian's face. Nobody can see inside another man, he said. Nobody can see another man's soul. Suddenly Dorian laughed. He gave a loud, unpleasant laugh. Come with me, Basil, he said, picking up the lamp from the table. You have said enough about my soul. Tonight you shall see it. Dorian led Basil upstairs towards the room in the attic. When they reached the door of the room, Dorian turned to Basil. Are you sure you want to come in? he asked. Yes, Basil said, but he was confused. What did Dorian mean? What was in the room? Dorian laughed again and unlocked the door. They walked across the room. Dorian put the lamp on an old table. Then he pointed at the cloth which covered the picture. You think that nobody can see another man's soul, he said. You're wrong. Pull away that cloth and you will see mine. Dorian's voice was hard and cruel. What are you talking about? Are you mad? asked Basil. Suddenly, Dorian pulled away the cloth and Basil saw the picture. He saw the terrible face in the picture smiling at him. It was the most awful face he had ever seen. Basil moved backwards, away from that cruel, evil face. He could see that it was his painting. It was his painting of the blonde, pale and beautiful young man. The hair was blonde, the mouth was red and the eyes were blue. But the face was wrinkled and ugly. And it was evil. Dorian watched Basil. He smiled unpleasantly. What does this mean? said Basil at last. Don't you know what it means, dear Basil? said Dorian. It means that my wish came true. Do you remember the day you finished this portrait? Do you remember the day I met Harry? Do you remember my wish? Oh, God, whispered Basil. You wished that the picture would grow old. You wished that you would stay young. Oh, no. Oh, yes, said Dorian. And the portrait shows you the true Dorian Gray. It shows you my soul. Basil sat down suddenly on an old chair. He put his head in his hands. Oh, God, he said. Oh, God, you must be very evil. You are more evil than anybody knows. Basil fell forward so his head and arms were on the table. He did not want to look at the picture again. We must pray, Dorian, he said. It is not too late. It is too late, replied Dorian. It's much too late to pray. Then suddenly Dorian became angry. He became angry with Basil. It was Basil's fault. Basil had painted the picture. He hated Basil. Dorian looked at the terrible face in the picture. It was smiling at him, and it was evil. A knife was lying on the old table. Dorian picked up the knife and looked at Basil. Then he stabbed his friend with the knife. He pushed the knife into Basil's neck. Basil's head hit the table, and Dorian stabbed him again and again. Basil made a terrible sound. He tried to breathe, but he could not. Blood came from his mouth. It became quiet in the attic room. Dorian listened. He heard the sound of Basil's blood dripping onto the carpet. There was no other sound. Dorian walked quietly across the room and looked out of the window. The fog had gone, and London was quiet. Dorian walked back across the room and picked up the lamp. He saw the dead thing lying across the table. It was so quiet, and its hands were very white. Dorian left the room and locked the door behind him. He went back to the library. Dorian quickly put Basil's suitcase and coat in a cupboard. People were hanged for murder, hanged by the neck until they were dead. Dorian did not want to be hanged. What was he going to do? Nobody has seen me arrive home, Dorian thought. The servants are asleep, and Basil was going to go to Paris tonight. He was going to catch the midnight train. Dorian soon decided what to do. It was five past two in the morning. Quietly, Dorian left the house and shut the door behind him. 
Then he started to ring the doorbell. After five minutes, his servant Francis opened the door. I'm sorry to wake you up, said Dorian, but I forgot my front door key. What time is it? Ten minutes past two, sir, replied Francis, looking at the clock. Oh dear, I'm very late, said Dorian. Did anybody call while I was out? Yes, sir, replied Francis. Mr. Hallward called. He waited for you until eleven o'clock, then he went away to catch a train. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see him. Did he leave a message? Yes, sir. He said he was going to Paris. He said he would write to you. Thank you, Francis, said Dorian. You can go to bed now. Dorian went back to the library. He had to think again. He walked up and down the room for a quarter of an hour. Then he picked up a book and looked through a list of addresses. At last he found the right address. Alan Campbell, 152 Hartford Street. Yes, Alan Campbell was the man he needed. <laughs> The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. At nine o'clock the next morning, Dorian was sleeping. He did not look like a man who had murdered a friend. But when he woke up, Dorian remembered what had happened. He tried not to think about Basil. He thought for a long time about which clothes to wear. He put on his rings. Then he took them off and put on different rings. Dorian ate his breakfast, but he could not forget Basil's body sitting at the table in the attic room. Then at last he wrote two letters. He put one letter in his pocket. He told his servant to take the other letter to Alan Campbell's house. Dorian went to the library. He lit a cigarette and tried not to think about Basil. He drew pictures, but they were pictures of Basil's face. He read poems, but the poems reminded him of Basil. Poor Basil, he thought. What a horrible way to die. Dorian became frightened. He thought about Alan Campbell. Perhaps Alan Campbell would not come. Alan Campbell was a very clever scientist. Dorian and Alan Campbell had been good friends for many years, but Alan had not talked to Dorian for eighteen months. Nobody knew why they were not friends any more. Now Dorian needed Alan's help. At last, Alan Campbell arrived. He had black hair and a very pale face. He looked very unhappy. Dorian was pleased to see him. Alan, he said, shaking hands, it is kind of you to come. Thank you for coming. Alan did not look pleased to see Dorian. I did not want to come, he said. I did not ever want to speak to you again. But your letter said it was very important, a matter of life and death. Yes, it is very important, said Dorian. Then he spoke very quickly. There's a dead man in a room upstairs. He's been dead for about ten hours. You must do something for me. You must. I don't want to know anything about this, said Alan Campbell. I won't do anything for you. Don't tell me your terrible secrets. I must tell you this secret, replied Dorian. You must help me. You are a scientist. You must destroy the body. No, I will not, said Alan Campbell. You are mad, Dorian, and I don't care what happens to you. The young man tried to leave the room, but Dorian stopped him. Alan, he said, it was murder. I murdered this man, and you are going to help me. Alan Campbell was horrified. He could not speak. Dorian sat down and quietly wrote something on a piece of paper. Then he gave the paper to the young man. Alan Campbell read what Dorian had written. His face became pale. His body started to shake. He fell down into a chair. There was silence. I am very sorry for you, said Dorian sadly. We both know what you did. I do not want to tell anybody the truth about you, but I will tell them if you don't help me. I have written a letter, and I will send it. Dorian pulled the letter out of his pocket. He showed Alan the address on the envelope. Oh, no, whispered Alan Campbell. Then, very quietly, he spoke again. I must go home. I need some things from my house. 
I need some scientific equipment so I can help you. You are not going to leave here, said Dorian. Write a list and one of my servants will get the things you need. Sadly, Alan wrote the list. Soon Dorian's servant brought the scientific equipment from Alan's house. Then Dorian sent his servant away. Alan Campbell and Dorian carried the equipment up to the attic room. There was a long piece of wire, two strange-shaped pieces of metal, and a large wooden box with bottles in it. Dorian unlocked the door and opened it. Basil's body was sitting at the table. Dorian did not want to look. He did not want to go into the room again. But suddenly Dorian saw that he had not covered the portrait again with the cloth. He ran across the room to cover the portrait. And then he saw blood on the hands in the picture. Bright red blood. The picture was more horrible than Basil's body. Dorian pulled the cloth over the picture quickly and went back to the library. He left Alan Campbell to do his work. Five hours later, Alan Campbell came into the library. His face was calm and pale. I have done what you asked me to do, he said quietly. Goodbye. I never want to see you again. As soon as Alan had left, Dorian went upstairs. There was a strange and horrible smell in the attic room, but the terrible thing sitting at the table had gone. <laughs> The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. That evening, Dorian dressed in beautiful clothes and went to a dinner party at a friend's house. But he did not enjoy the party and did not want to eat anything. Are you all right? asked Harry. And were you all right last night? You left last night's party very early, about eleven o'clock. Yes, no, I'm fine. I don't know what I did last night, said Dorian quickly. Uh, yes, I do. I, I went for a walk. I got home about two o'clock in the morning. I forgot my key. I had to wake the servant. You can ask him if you don't believe me. Dorian spoke quickly and sounded confused. Harry was surprised. My dear boy, I don't care what you did, he said. Perhaps you were ill. Yes, replied Dorian. I'm not feeling well. I think I'll go home. When Dorian got home, he knew he had to do something terrible. He had to burn Basil's coat and suitcase, so that nobody would find out the truth about Basil's death. People thought Basil had gone to Paris. Nobody expected to see him for six months. The coat and suitcase smelt horrible when he burnt them. Dorian felt very unhappy. He wanted to leave the house and forget everything. At midnight, Dorian went out and found a cab. He told the cab driver quietly where he wanted to go. The man shook his head. He looked frightened. It's too far. I can't go there at this time of night, he said. Here's a pound for you, said Dorian, and I'll give you another one if you drive fast. All right, sir. We'll be there in an hour, said the driver. Then he made the horse pull the cab fast along the streets. The cab went east towards the River Thames. It was another foggy, dark night in London. The light of street lamps shone through the fog. Cold rain began to fall. Men and women were walking home along the streets. Dorian heard screams and shouts and horrible laughter. He sat back on the seat of the cab, watching. He hated London. He hated life. He wanted to forget everything. He wanted opium, the drug that would make him forget. The cab drove on through dirty, poor parts of the city. Near the river, the fog disappeared. Dorian left the cab and walked towards the river. The moon was shining on the water. The ships on the river were big and black. The light from street lamps shone down onto the wet road. Soon he reached a small, dirty house. Inside the house it was dark. A dirty green curtain hung over a doorway. Dorian went through the doorway and into a long room. A few men were drinking. A sailor, half asleep, lay with his head on a table. Two women were arguing. Dorian went through this room and up some stairs to another one. He could smell opium, and he smiled with pleasure. 
Now he could smoke some opium and forget everything. But then Dorian saw a young man smoking a pipe full of opium. Immediately Dorian recognised him. It was Adrian Singleton, who had been a friend of Dorian's. Adrian Singleton has disappeared, Basil had said. But here was Adrian in an opium den. Dorian went quickly back to the first room. He did not want to see anyone he knew. He would go to another opium den. As he went back through the green curtain, a voice called after him. One of the women was shouting, Look at him! There he is! Prince Charming! Suddenly the sailor lifted his head from the table. Don't talk to me! shouted Dorian angrily to the woman. And he ran out of the house. Dorian turned a corner into a narrow, dark street. He was running to another opium den. He was trying to forget about Adrian Singleton. Suddenly a strong hand was round Dorian's neck. Keep quiet or I'll shoot you, said a voice. Dorian turned round and saw a gun pointing at his head. He saw a large man, a sailor. Are you mad? Dorian said. What have I done to you? My sister is dead because of you, replied the sailor. Sybil Vane killed herself and now I'm going to kill you. I have looked for you for years, and tonight I heard the name she called you. Dorian was afraid. He looked at James Vane and could not move. This man was going to kill him. Then suddenly Dorian had an idea. How long is it since your sister died? he asked. Seventeen years. Why do you ask? replied the man. Look at me. Look at me by the light of a street lamp, said Dorian. James Vane pulled Dorian back to the main street, and in the light of a street lamp he saw the face of a beautiful young man. It was the face of a young man of about twenty. You can't be the man, said James Vane. My God, I was going to murder you. Uh, I'm very sorry, sir. You must be more careful, Dorian said. Then he walked away round the corner and into the darkness. As soon as Dorian had gone, the woman from the opium den ran up to the sailor. Why didn't you kill him? she asked. He's evil. He's not the man I want, he replied. The man I want is about forty. That young man was twenty. The woman gave a horrible laugh. Ha ha ha! Twenty? Him? Prince Charming? I first saw Prince Charming seventeen years ago, but he hasn't changed since then. You're lying! shouted James Vane. I'm not, said the woman. He was a beautiful young man seventeen years ago, and he hasn't changed since then. He's evil, that one. Swear to God that you're not lying. I swear I'm not lying, the woman replied. James Vane believed her. He ran round the corner into the narrow dark street, but Dorian had gone. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. A week later, Dorian was at his house in the country. Many people had come to stay with him. They were rich people who enjoyed talking and eating and drinking. Dorian's guests also enjoyed shooting, shooting birds and animals. One evening, Dorian was with Harry and another friend, Lady Monmouth, Harry was laughing and saying clever things, as he usually did. Lady Monmouth was laughing and listening to Harry. Dorian was listening too. I must leave you now, said Lady Monmouth. I want to change my dress before we have dinner. Let me get you some flowers. You can wear them on your dress, said Dorian, getting up from his chair and leaving the room. Oh, said Lady Monmouth. I hope he gets me flowers that will look right with the colour of my dress. Let's follow him, replied Harry, and you can tell him the colour of your dress. As they left the room, Harry and Lady Monmouth suddenly heard a crash. In the next room, they found Dorian. He was lying on the floor next to a window. He had fainted. Dorian soon opened his eyes, but his body was shaking and his face was very pale. Are you ill, dear boy? asked Harry. You fainted. You must go and lie down. No. 
said Dorian quickly. I don't want to lie down. I don't want to be alone. So Dorian had dinner with his guests. He talked and laughed with them. He made jokes and told stories. But he was remembering the white face looking at him through the window. It had been the face of James Vane. The next day, Dorian would not leave his bedroom. He felt ill and he was frightened. He was frightened if he heard a noise or saw a door open. He remembered Sybil Vane. He remembered the murder of Basil. He remembered the face at the window. Dorian lay in bed, but he did not sleep. During the day, Harry went into Dorian's room and found Dorian crying. After two days, Dorian was not so frightened. James Vane could not know where he was. James Vane must be in London. He had imagined James Vane's face at the window. On the third day, Dorian was feeling better. Some of his guests were going out to shoot birds, and Dorian decided to go too. It was a cold day, and the sun was shining. Dorian felt happy as he walked through the woods. Harry and Lady Monmouth walked beside him. Suddenly, one of the guests shot at something among the trees. There was a cry, the terrible cry of a man in pain. People shouted and ran towards the noise. Soon they pulled the body of a man out of the trees. Dorian watched in horror. Harry touched Dorian's arm. I think we'd better stop shooting today, he said. Oh, Harry, this is terrible, and something more terrible is going to happen. I know it, replied Dorian. Don't worry about it, Dorian, said Harry. It was an accident. It wasn't a murder. Harry was never serious for long. I would like to meet a person who has done a real murder, he went on laughing. Lady Monmouth laughed too, but Dorian suddenly felt ill. His face became very pale. Dorian smiled politely. I'm feeling tired. I must go to my room. Excuse me. In his room, Dorian lay down on his bed. His body shook with terror. Fear and death were everywhere in this house. He did not want to spend another night here. At five o'clock, Dorian told his servant that he wanted to take the night train to London. The servant went to pack Dorian's suitcases, but he soon returned. Excuse me, sir, he said to Dorian. There is a problem with the dead man, the man who was shot. Yes, what is it? said Dorian. Do you need money to give to his family? No, sir, this is the problem. We don't know who he is. He was carrying some money and a gun, but we could not find his name on anything. Uh, he's a sailor. A sailor? cried Dorian. Suddenly he was excited and hopeful. He ran to the door. Where is the body? Quick, I want to see it now. The body had been taken to a farm. It lay on the floor in one of the buildings. A handkerchief covered the dead man's face. Take that cloth off the face, said Dorian. A farm worker took away the handkerchief. Then Dorian looked down at the face and gave a cry of joy. The man who had been shot was James Vane. Dorian went home with his eyes full of tears. They were tears of joy because he was safe. James Vane could not kill him now. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. One evening in June, Dorian was visiting Harry. Harry and Dorian sat in Harry's library. Harry, I have done too many terrible things in my life, said Dorian. Yesterday I started to change my life. I'm going to be good. Harry smiled. Where were you yesterday? he asked. I was at an inn in a small village, replied Dorian. What did you do at this inn? asked Harry, laughing. How did you start to be good? I met a girl, said Dorian. She was a pretty girl called Hetty. She looked like Sybil Vane. Hetty and I were going to go away together, Dorian went on. But I decided not to go away with her. I decided to leave her in her village. I have done something good. You are pleased because you have done something good, said Harry, 
but she will kill herself because you left her. Don't say that. You were never serious, said Dorian angrily. You wanted to be good, so you left her, replied Harry. You did what you wanted to do. You haven't changed. Harry was right. Dorian did not want to talk about Hetty again. Have you got any news? he asked. No, there is nothing else to talk about, replied Harry. People are talking about Basil. Nobody knows what has happened to him. Basil, said Dorian in a surprised voice. Are people still talking about him? It's a month since people noticed that he had not come back from Paris. My dear boy, people will talk about Basil for three months. Then they will talk about somebody else. They will talk about Alan Campbell's death, too. He killed himself, you know. Dorian did not want to talk about Alan Campbell, but he talked about Basil. What do you think happened to Basil, Harry? I don't know. Perhaps he is dead. I don't want to think about it, replied Harry. There was silence for a while. Then Dorian spoke again. People are saying that Basil was murdered, aren't they? Do you think Basil was murdered? Nobody would want to murder Basil, replied Harry. Everybody liked Basil. He didn't have any enemies. Perhaps I murdered Basil, said Dorian. Have you thought of that, Harry? Dorian watched Harry carefully, but Harry laughed. <laughs> You're talking nonsense, dear boy. You couldn't murder anybody. Let's talk about something else, Harry continued. Poor Basil isn't interesting any more. He hadn't painted a good picture for a long time. What happened to his picture of you, Dorian? Oh, I lost it, replied Dorian quickly. You look the same now, as young as you were when the picture was painted, said Harry. Don't change your life. You have had a good life. You have done everything you wanted to do, and you have not changed at all. I'm not the same as that young man, said Dorian. I want to change. I want to be good. Don't change, said Harry. You're beautiful and you are perfect. You and I will always be friends. As he left Harry's house, Dorian's face was very sad. It was a warm night. Dorian started to walk home from Harry's house. He walked past two young men and heard one of them whisper, that's Dorian Gray. Dorian felt tired. He did not want people to recognise him. He did not want people to talk about him any longer. He did not want to hear his name. As he walked, Dorian thought about his life. Dorian suddenly wanted to be young again. He wanted to be the young man whose picture Basil had painted. Dorian was still thinking when he reached home. Perhaps it was not too late to change his life. He had been kind to Hetty. He had left her in her village. Perhaps he was starting to be good. Dorian went up to the attic room. He wanted to look at the picture. Perhaps the picture was changing again. Perhaps the picture was not so ugly now. Perhaps the cruel, evil face was changing and becoming kinder. But the face in the picture was the same. It was old and wrinkled and ugly. The eyes were cruel. The mouth was evil. The blood was still on the hands. When Dorian saw the picture, he knew the truth. He knew that he could never change. He would always be evil. There was a knife on the table in the attic room. He had used that knife to kill Basil. Dorian picked up the knife. It had killed Basil, and now it would kill his painting. Then nobody would ever know that Dorian Gray was an evil man. There was a loud crash and a cry. It was a loud and horrible cry which woke the servants. There were two men in the street outside, and they heard the cry too. Whose house is this? asked one of the men. Dorian Gray's, replied the other man. The two men looked at each other in horror, then they quickly walked away. Inside the house it was now quiet. The door of the attic room was locked, but at last the frightened servants opened it. Inside the room they found a picture hanging on a wall. It was a picture of their master, Dorian Gray. He looked young and beautiful in the picture. 
He looked the same as he had always looked. On the floor, they found a man. He was ugly and old and wrinkled. His face was evil, and he was dead with a knife in his heart. At first, the servants did not know the man, but then they looked at the rings on his fingers, and they knew who it was. <laughs> The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want.